so today our speaker is Yui Makarichev from DTI Chicago. Yui graduated from Princeton and he works on approximation algorithms, unique games, metric embeddings, and things like that. And uh, today he's going to talk about constant factor approximation uh, for balance cuts in real world graphs. Uh, and we are now going to go around the table and introduce all the groups. Before we do that, the next speakers, uh, we have quite a few speakers lined up. So the next speaker is Ryan Williams in two weeks, and then it's David Woodruff, and then Gian Ring for, from U Chicago in two weeks from then. OK, so we should now go around the table. And, okay. uh, yes, thanks, Anindya. So we have various people here again tonight. We have uh, John Don Dubey from ETH Zurich. Hello. We have Hawk Bennett from NYU. Hi. We have Madhu Tulziani, the group from uh, TTICU Chicago. And uh, yeah, that's it. The other ones are still on the well, way. Well, Grant back. Yeah, we have oh, Grant I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we have Grant from uh, Michigan. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yes. Okay, so yeah. Okay, then we should start the talk now. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to TCS Plus. So I will talk about a constant factor approximation algorithm for balanced cut in the Pi model. My talk is based on joint work uh, with Konstantin Makarichev and Aravindan Vijayaragavan. And let me first. Uh, let me first uh, give a brief overview of my talk. So I will start with explaining the motivation behind our research. Then I will define the balanced cut problem, tell you about some known results for balanced cut, and uh, show you some known uh, random and semi-random models for balanced cut. Then I will present our new model, the Pi model, uh, tell you about it, and finally, I will talk about our algorithm in, for the balanced cut problem in the Pi model. Uh, probably I don't have much time to describe the algorithm in detail, but I will try to show you key ideas. So this is our uh, plan for today. Um, all right. Just a second, I have some technical problem. I hope it's okay. Uh, okay, now no, no, it's fine. Okay, <clears throat> so so let's start. And um, first, let me start with the motivation. So, in combinatorial optimization, we deal with many uh, combinatorial optimization problems that are NP hard and that we cannot solve exactly efficiently if P is not equal to NP. And so instead of solving these problems exactly, we want to design efficient algorithms that just find good solutions uh, to these problems. And of course, these words good solution are, are somewhat informal, and there are several ways to formalize them. And the way the approach, uh, which is the most popular in theoretical computer science is to say that we want to design an algorithm that gives a small alpha approximation in the worst case. So we want to design an algorithm that always finds a solution of cost at most times, uh, at most alpha times optimum, no matter what the input instance is. And we want this approximation factor alpha to be as small as possible. And this approach has a number of advantages. It's always nice not to assume anything about um, our instances, right? But at the same time, it has also limitations. And often, uh, worst case instances are much harder than real world instances, those instances that arise in practice. 
and so for many actually for, for many problems we have provable results that there are no good approximation algorithms in the worst case but still we have um, algorithms that work well in practice and so since we cannot get good approximation algorithms for the worst case we want to design um, an algorithm that works well for some large class of nice instances but doesn't necessarily work well on worst case instances and this approach is not is not novel it's used in theoretical computer science it's also used in other fields and for example in mathematics right we want to integrate functions but not every function is integrable so in the worst case the function is not integrable but there are some nice functions like smooth functions continuous functions uh, that are integrable and we want to study them and similarly in combinatorial optimization we want to identify some nice uh, functions and design good approximation algorithms for these nice instances so not, not nice functions here but nice instances of combinatorial optimization problems now we need to define uh, these nice uh, sorry we, we need to design uh, we, we need uh, to define these nice instances and essentially there are two different approaches uh, we can say that an instance is nice if it satisfies certain properties uh, this is a very common approach for example uh, there are algorithms for bounded degree graphs for planar graphs for bounded genus graphs and graphs that ha have some other nice properties uh, another approach is to say that an instance is nice if it's generated in a certain way if it's generated according to some model uh, for instance we can say that a, 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 an instance is nice if it is sample from a certain distribution uh, and perhaps, perhaps the simplest example is just to say that our instance our graph is a random GNP graph and in this work uh, we, we use the second approach so we define a class of nice instances that are generated according to a certain model now uh, what uh, do we want our model to be so we want the model to be uh, as general as possible and capture a very large class of instances ideally we wanted to capture many instances that arise in practice real world instances on the other hand uh, the model should not be too general in the sense that it should capture only those instances that are simpler than worst case instances uh, because if, 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 if we have very difficult instances in, uh, in our model then we will not be able to beat algorithms for the worst case so this is what we want uh, to do uh, also on this slide on the previous slide I sort of described different slightly different approaches and I think that it's, it's nice to have many different models because uh, instances that, that arise in different applications are very different and perhaps it's unlikely that just one model will uh, work for all for all instances that we have and also even from a pure theoretical point of view it's nice uh, to have different models and then perhaps we will better understand uh, our combinatorial optimization problems understand which instances are easy and which instances are hard so and this is uh, uh, our motivation now let me uh, define uh, the problem that we cut uh, that, that, that we solve so we study uh, the minimum balance cut problem uh, in this problem uh, we are given a graph G and we want to partition it into two balanced pieces uh, so as to minimize the number of cut ages uh, so formally um, uh, formally we want to uh, divide the graph into two sets s and t uh, so that every uh, of each of the sets s and t contains 
a certain constant fraction of all vertices, and our objective is to minimize uh, the number of uh, cut edges, number of edges between S and T. Uh, what is known about this problem? So this problem uh, is NP-hard. Uh, the best known algorithm for this problem is due to Aurora, Rao, and Vizirani. It gives square root log n approximation. This is a pseudo-approximation algorithm, so it may slightly violate uh, the balancedness constraint and say instead of finding a one-third, two-third balanced cut, it might find one-third minus epsilon, two-third plus epsilon balanced cut. If you want to, uh, if you don't want to violate uh, the balancedness constraint at all, then the best algorithm is due to Reiki. It gives log n approximation. And um, also Raghavendra, Storer, and Tulsiani showed uh, that there is no constant factor approximation algorithm for this problem. Uh, if a certain complexity assumption is true, specifically if the small set expansion conjecture is true. So it's unlikely that we can get constant factor approximation for this problem in the worst case. Uh, okay, so uh, the best algorithm in the worst case is the algorithm of Aurora, Ra, and Vizirani. It gives square root log n approximation. But uh, there has been also a lot of research on this problem uh, uh, and on various random and semi-random models for this problem. Uh, so the first, uh, the, the first uh, random model, the, the, random, the random planted cut model, uh, was introduced in earlier 80s by Bu, Chan, Huri, Leighton, and Sipser, and by Dyer and Fries, and, and and then uh, actually this this model became very popular. So there, there has been a lot of research on on, on this model. It was uh, extended and uh, extended, generalized, and uh, in many works. And also uh, the original results on of Bu et al. and of uh, Dyer and Fries were uh, significantly strengthened. Let me first uh, describe this model. Uh, so in, <clears throat> this model is, is similar uh, to, in a sense, uh, to, to the random GNP model. We start with an empty graph on n vertices. All vertices of the graph are partitioned into two sets, L and R, of equal size, so each of them contains n over two vertices. And now we start adding edges to this graph. So uh, we connect every vertex in L with every vertex in R with certain fixed probability epsilon 1. And we connect every two vertices in L and every two vertices in R with probability epsilon 2. And we get this uh, random graph. And now, um, in this model, epsilon 1 is smaller than epsilon 2. And so, at least intuitively, this cut between L and R is sparser than those cuts that cut sets L and R. And, in fact, uh, various authors prove that this is the case. Let me uh, mention one, uh, one of the strongest results, the result of Bapana. So he proved that if uh, epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 is greater than um, a certain threshold, which is square root of epsilon 2 log n over n. So if there is some gap between epsilon 2 and uh, epsilon 1, then indeed this uh, planted cut LR, so our initial cut LR, is uh, the optimal balanced cut. And uh, moreover, uh, there is an efficient algorithm that finds this cut um, <coughs> in polynomial time. Now, all the statements, of course, hold this high probability. Our graphs are random, so we cannot say that this holds for every graph, but this holds this high probability. OK, uh, yes. so I have a question to this. Yes. So, so you're saying that if epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 is bigger or equal than this, this root epsilon stuff, then you have both statements. So there is an efficient algorithm, and the algorithm is, is un and the cut is unique. Right. 
And this is really, I mean, it's the same bout for both, right? That it can, I mean, the, there is a, a good algorithm in this case, right. and it's unique. I mean, it's, it's uh, right. Unique. It's true that uh, the balanced cut, uh, yes, the balanced cut is unique. It, it is equal to this cut LR, and there is an algorithm that finds this cut. Okay. Uh, there are some slightly stronger bounds, and in this case, uh, uh, there is an algorithm also that finds uh, the the optimal cut, but it doesn't have to be LR. I see. And I see. Um, uh, let me just mention that there are also generalizations, uh, for example, by, by Matt Sherry, for uh, for cases where we have many sets, not not two sets, but many sets, um, many clusters. <clears throat> Yuri. Uh, yeah. What are the best results known? Uh, so the best is uh, the, the best result is 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 uh, if epsilon two minus epsilon one is is, is square root log n over um, n, roughly speaking. Um, so this is basically tight. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, if it's square root log. Yeah, I mean, it de depends on epsilon 2, epsilon 1, but uh, the, the best result of epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1 is roughly speaking square root um, log n over n. Um, uh, uh, there are also some... Uh, there are also some uh, generalizations of this model. So in uh, 1998, Feige and Kilian uh, proposed a sum semi-random uh, model, which strengthens uh, strengthens the uh, the planted cut model, and in general, sort of what is so, 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 so what is a semi-random model? In a semi-random model, some choices are random and some choices are adversarial. So it's a sort of combination of um, the worst case model and a random model. So in, in this model of Feige and Killian. Uh, we start with a random graph as, as 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 I described before, and then we invite an adversary, and the adversary removes some edges between L and R, and also adds some edges two sets L and two sets R. And it turns out that in this case we can also uh, find uh, this partition L and R with high probability under the same assumption that there is a gap between epsilon 2 and epsilon 1. And one can see this result as a sort of a robust version of the previous result that I mentioned. Uh, Yuri? Yes. So here the adversary sort of seems to be helping, right? Because it's actually making the cut sparser and uh, more or less ensuring that that's uh, still the unique cut. Uh, right. So, 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 sort of intuitively, adversary helps us because the cut between L and R indeed becomes sparser. So the optimal s solution becomes better, and other solutions potentially become worse. Uh, and I guess intuitively, this problem even might be seen as easier one. O of course, it's also captured the previous case, uh, but it's not clear whether algorithms uh, f for the GNP case work for. For this model, and I think that some some algorithms don't. Uh, okay. So, in, in particular, Feige and Killian use a different approach. So they use semi-definite programming, and previous papers used uh, very, uh, many other many other different approaches, but not as deep. So eigenvalue-based approaches, you're saying, might not work. So. Uh, in particular, it's not clear. I, I, yeah, I don't know if it works or not. Um, let me now mention our previous result uh, for, 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 uh, for, for, for this problem. So we proposed a different semi-random model. Uh, so here, uh, the graph inside L and the graph inside R, so these two graphs are completely adversarial, and the graph between L and R is random. So at first, the adversary chooses an, an arbitrary graph inside L and inside R, and then we connect every two vertices in L and in R. Uh, we connect every vertex in L 
with every vertex in R with probability epsilon. And all our choices are independent. And here, uh, in this model, uh, it's no longer uh, possible to find sets L and R, even information theoretically. Uh, so what we show that if epsilon is greater than roughly, roughly sticking square root log n over n up to some uh, log log n factor, then uh, we can find a constant factor approximation to the uh, balanced cut problem. So in this case, we cannot find this cut L and R. It's not, it's not necessarily optimal, but we can find uh, a constant factor approximation. So can I ask a question to that? So that, yes. I mean, it, it seems confusing because it seems to me that I would think that the problem becomes easier if epsilon becomes smaller. OK, yeah, so um, I guess uh, uh, what, what, we, what we have here and what we will have today is that we have some uh, additive error term. And this error, additive error, so, so, so we can state our result as a constant factor approximation plus an additive error term. And uh, just if the number of uh, edges in the planted solution is small, then the additive term is much more than uh, the cost of the optimal solution. And so it's essentially the cost of our solution becomes the cost of the additive term. And it becomes less interesting. Uh, and, and uh, so, so, so I will show uh, the statement of, of, of the result that, uh, that I'm describing in this lecture. And there we don't have this assumption on epsilon. So it, it, it probably the way we, in, we state it now is more, is more intuitive. I agree with that. Uh, so it's a bit uh, strange condition. Um, and OK, so, so, so what we did, uh, what we did, we got rid of randomness in sets L and R. And we assume that they are, on, they are adversarial. Can we assume that actually edges both inside L, inside R, and between L and R are adversarial? And this is what we do in our uh, new um, results, so or the, the result I'm going to talk about in the Pi model. And of course, we cannot just assume that all edges are adversarial and they are added by the same adversary. Because in this case, we get uh, the worst case model, right? If, if just the adversary all, adds all edges, we, we get the worst case result. And we cannot hope to beat algorithms for the worst case. So let's, uh, let's assume that we have two adversaries. And first, I will describe the model informally. Then I will uh, make it more precise. So the first adversary adds edges between uh, vertices so uh, as edges um, in L and in R. So the first adversary uh, connects some vertices that uh, connects some pairs of vertices that lie in L and also connects some uh, pairs of vertices that lie in R. Uh, then we invite another adversary, and this adversary does not see uh, these graphs L and R doesn't see the edges that the first adversary added and add some edges between L and R. And then uh, we combine these two graphs, and we get a graph in our pi model. Uh, so this is uh, the idea behind our, this is sort of an informal explanation of our model. Now, I didn't explain what information these adversaries can share what information they cannot share. So let me now formally restate the same model. Uh, so we have two adversaries. The first adversary chooses a graph G on uh, a set of vertices L union R. And in this graph, uh, no edge crosses the cut. So uh, all edges lie either inside L or completely inside R. Uh, now, the second adversary chooses a bipartite graph on another copy of the same vertex set. So on uh, vertices L prime and R prime. And by saying that, we, we, we say that 
the second adversary doesn't see uh, the edges that the first adversary added. And then we randomly identify vertices of L prime and L and vertices of R prime and R. So formally, we choose a random one-to-one -one map that maps vertices of L prime to L and vertices of R prime to R. And then for every vertex of the graph H, we add the corresponding vertex to the graph G. Yuri? Yeah. It, it seems like this is um, incommensurate with the previous uh, Feige Killian model, or Feige, or whoever did that model. Um, that that model contains some um, distributions that this doesn't, but this also contains many distributions that that doesn't. Is that correct? Uh, so, so, so in general, it's it, it yeah, it doesn't it doesn't uh, general. It, uh, there are some distributions that the model of Feige and Killian contains, and this does not, right? Okay. Just want to make sure I was understanding. Uh, but but in general, in, in, but this one captures main, many distributions that that one does. Yeah, definitely. Um, let me let me also give an example how this works. Uh, so this is just a toy example. In this case, we have this graph G on six vertices, H is on six vertices, and we have these two graphs. G is on the left, uh, H is on the right. Uh, we take uh, now a random one-to-one -one mapping between vertices of H and G, and for every edge of H, we add uh, the corresponding uh, edge to G. So we get this graph on the left, and uh, then we get about H, and we get uh, a graph in our model. Uh, and also, <clears throat> let me mention one important uh, particular case of this model. So uh, in our model, we may assume so, so, so that the second adversary samples the set of edges from a permutation invariant distribution. And what I mean by that, that the, the distribution is invariant under permutation of vertices in L and under permutation of vertices in R. And in this case, uh, if the, the distribution is like that, we don't have to apply this permutation pi. So what happens is that the first adver adversary chooses arbitrary edges in L and R, and then we just sample the set of edges between L and R from this distribution. And here, it's very important that uh, we don't make any assumptions that edges are independent. So edges don't have to be independent. Uh, for example, we can just take one random vertex on the left and connect it with all vertices on the right. Or uh, we can write uh, or we can run some kind of preferential attachment model that looks only on the edges between uh, L and R, and this is okay. It's um, permutation invariant. So the model uh, makes much less assumptions on the distribution of edges between L and R than um, the standard model, so we don't make any independence assumptions uh, here. Uh, so, <coughs> so this model makes uh, weaker assumptions than uh, in previous models, uh, and in our in our we also think that it's it's somewhat realistic. So and it captures many uh, real world processes. So uh, roughly speaking, in some real cases, so in real life, sometimes. Uh, some edges are added by one process. Some uh, edges are added by another process. We don't know anything about these processes. We don't make any assumptions about these processes, but we just know that they are independent. And one example is uh, creation of social networks. And say uh, we may assume that there are some local ties that are based on geographical proximity, like some people 
who live in one city know each other. We don't know exactly who knows who and how the social ties are created, but they are local. And there are some uh, long distance ties between pe people and they are created by a different process. For example, pe pe people in one city know uh, pe people in other cities based on their professional interests or uh, some other um, uh, interests. And this is an example where we have uh, different processes that uh, create different types of edges, different types of ties. Uh, so now what, what do we prove for this model? Uh, we give uh, an algorithm that finds a balanced cut. Uh, this cut um, is balanced. It doesn't necessarily perfectly balanced. Uh, the cost of this cut is at most some constant times the planted uh, cost plus this additive uh, term n times log to the power of cn, and c is a small constant. Uh, and so, so, so I, I guess the right way to think about this additive term is to say that if the cost of the planted solution uh, is, is, is greater than uh, n, uh, n poly log n, then our algorithm gives a constant factor approximation. And if the cost of the planted solution is, is, is much smaller than this additive term, then the result be becomes not interesting. So uh, the interesting case here is when the cost of the planted solution is n log n or, or greater than that. And, uh, and also uh, know that here uh, we compare the cost of the solution to the cost of the planted cut, cut LR. And potentially, there might be another cut which is cheaper than this, but we don't compare uh, the cost uh, with um, the optimal cut. Uh, so this is the result. So we give a constant factor approximation in this pi model. Uh, and there are two caveats. The first one is that we compare the cost with the cost of the planted solution, and the, the second one that we have this additive uh, term. So I described, uh, I described our motivation. I described the model. And I want to talk about uh, the algorithm. And let, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, Yuri. Yeah. It's probably going ahead. But, uh, uh, is it also possible to so conceive some kind of algorithmic guarantee when I don't permute both L and R, but only one uh, side when you identify the bipartite graph with the, or maybe like, I can choose which side I want to permute randomly, but if I only want to permute one side. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. OK. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. So, 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 so certainly, we we need that uh, we permit both sides, and if we permit one side, uh, yeah, at, at least certainly our algorithm doesn't work, and, and I'm not sure that it, it's possible. Nice. Thanks. Uh, so uh, our algorithm is based on some IDF and programming. We use uh, the standard SDP relaxation, which was used by Aurora Rao and Vizirani in their paper. Let me uh, describe it. So for every vertex u, we introduce an indicator vector bar u. And in the intended solution, if a vertex lies on the right, then we assign it a, a unit vector, some fixed unit vector E. If uh, a vertex lies on the left, then we assign it, if it uh, the vector minus E. Uh, so we use just two vectors, E and minus E, in the intended solution. And depending on whether the vertex is in L or, or R, we assign it either E or minus E. Now, in the intended solution, the number of cut edges is equal to this um, objective function. So this term u minus v squared 
is equal to zero if u and v lie in one set, and otherwise it's equal to to four, and there is also this normalization factor four, so the contribution is equal to one. Uh, and this is this is how the intended solution looks like. So if you have two sets L and R, and we assign vectors E and minus E uh, to the vertices. Now we write the SDP relaxation. So if you have a unit vector bar U for each vertex U, uh, our goal is to minimize this uh, SDP objective function. We also add the spreading constraint. Uh, the spreading constraint says that the average squared Euclidean distance between two vertices is at least two. Uh, so the goal of this constraint is to ensure that not all uh, vertices cluster together. So that they are sort of spread out on the, on, on the surface, on, on the unit sphere. And this is a valid constraint because uh, the planted solution is balanced. So half of all vertices are on the left, and half of them are on the right. So the average, uh, uh, the average distance is at least uh, two. We also have L2 squared triangle inequalities, and I, I will not talk about them in this talk. So uh, let's ignore them uh, for this lecture. Now, when we solve this SDP, of course, we don't get a nice solution like the intended solution, but rather uh, we get some assignment of unit vectors uh, to the vertices of the graph. It looks looks like that. So it's an arbitrary assignment of unit vectors. Uh, our plan now is uh, to do the following, to do two, two steps. Uh, we, we want to identify many, actually we want to identify most uh, vertices, uh, sorry, most edges between L and R. We, of course, our algorithm doesn't know L and R, so this is not a trivial goal. And we want to remove most most edges between L and R, possibly remove some edges within L and within R, but we want to remove a small number of uh, edges in total. So the total number of edges we want to remove should be of order uh, the, the the cost of the planted solution, comparable to the number of edges in H. Uh, when we do that, the cost of this planted solution, LR, uh, goes down dramatically. Uh, specifically, we want it to, to go down by a factor square root log n. Uh, then we run the algorithm of Aurora Rho and Vizirani on this um, sort of sparsified instance. Uh, since the cost of the optimal solution here is by a factor square root log n smaller, than the cost in the original solution, uh, uh, the algorithm of Aurora Round with Irani finds a solution whose cost is at most the cost in the original solution. Uh, so this is uh, the solution that the algorithm of Aurora Round with Irani finds. It's not necessarily uh, the planted solution LR, uh, but uh, this solution cuts the this solution cuts order of the planted uh, cost number of edges, and we also removed order of the planted uh, cost number of edges, so the, the cost of the solution is order of planted cost. Uh, so this is our plan. <coughs> and uh, before I describe the algorithm, let's look how an SDP solution looks like. Let's look at two extreme cases. So one extreme case is looks like the intended solution. So here we have uh, two clusters of vertices, and vertices in one cluster look, uh, face one direction, vertices in the other cluster face the opposite direction. And there is another extreme case where there are no clusters, where all points are distributed, roughly speaking, uniformly on the sphere. And note that if we take uh, two random points in the second case, then uh, the corresponding vectors are, are likely uh, very far from each other. So the angle between them is some constant vector. 
and the distance between them is some constant distance. Uh, in the first case, uh, if we take two random points, that it's quite possible that uh, the corresponding vectors um, are equal or close to each other. Uh, so now I will describe uh, the algorithm. Uh, so the algorithm is an iterative algorithm that performs the following steps um, um, over and over. So it, uh, first it solves the SDP relaxation. Uh, then it finds and removes all edges of length, at least delta. So it finds all edges UV such, such that the squared Euclidean distance between vectors bar U and bar V is at least delta. And here delta is some fixed constant. We can take it, say, to be equal 1 over 16. And uh, this step takes care, roughly speaking, of the second extreme case. So uh, recall that when we, uh, we, when we combine graphs G and H, uh, we, we use this random permutation phi. And so roughly speaking, every edge of H is, is glued to random positions in the graph G. And sort of intuitively, uh, here we take care uh, of, uh, of edges of, of the graph H if the solution looks like that. Uh, so an edge of the graph H connects at, in some sense, not precisely, but in some sense, uh, random points in G. And these points are far from each other. So this edge is, is, is long, and we find it and remove. Now we have another step. And in this step, we remove heavy clusters. So we, we find uh, a subset of vertices such that um, vectors assigned to these vertices are close to each other. So, <clears throat> and uh, the number of vertices in this cluster is large. And we remove such cluster. Uh, and finally, we have um, a, a very technical step where we repair the graph. Uh, this step is very important, but I will not describe it because it's too technical. And the goal of this step is roughly speaking to do the following. So initially, our graph if, is from our pi model. Now, after we perform steps two and three, we remove some edges, we remove some vertices, and the graph may look differently. And now at the step four, we additionally remove some parts of the graph so as to ensure that it again looks like a graph from the pi model. I mean, this is a very informal description, but um, I don't want to, uh, to, to be too technical. Uh, so now I'll, I'll, I'll describe these steps in, in, in more detail. But this is the outline how our algorithm works. And let's make two simplifying assumptions. So let's consider a very special case. So let's assume that our graph G, this is a graph that the first adversary chooses, is a capital D regular. The graph H, the graph that the second adversary chooses, is small d regular, and capital D is much greater than small d. Now, uh, so Yuri, we, can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is this algorithm uh, more or less the same as previous algorithms module the technical step, or is it quite a bit different um, from the Feige Killian and the and the previous uh, the previous one? Uh, so the algorithm is very different. I mean, uh, pretty much uh, as an algorithm it has nothing to do with previous uh, algorithm for the planted model, and uh, it's very different from the uh, the algorithm of the Feige and Killian. So the algorithm of Feige and Killian, roughly speaking, just solves the SDP, and it turns out that the SDP solution is integral. Uh, so and it, it, it's not an iterative algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is also very different, quite different from our previous algorithm for the previous model, though the general appro approach is somewhat similar. Do they do they all use the same SDP, or is that different as well? Uh, 
So the SDP, so, so we use the theme SDP5 and Killian uh, use, uh, I don't remember, either they use the theme SDP or I'm not sure if they need triangular inequalities. Okay. Uh, but the algorithm of Aurora run with Rani uses the theme SDP. Okay. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we, we, we consider uh, this very special case now. So G is a G regular and H is a small G regular graph. Uh, let uh, bar U be the SDP solution and we consider the distance function on our graph. So the distance between vertices U and V is equal to the distance between the corresponding vectors squared. And we have some um, constraints in the SDP that ensure that this function D is indeed the metric. So it satisfies uh, uh, the auto squared triangle inequalities. And now let's say that an edge UV is short if the distance between U and V is less than delta. And again, delta is just some fixed constant, let's say 1 or 16. Uh, <clears throat> and um, what we need is a special property. Let me uh, not first state this property, and we will prove it later. The property is the following. If every ball of radius 3 delta contains at most eta and vertices, then the number of short edges in H is less than some constant times eta times the number of vertices, as the number of edges in H. So in other words, uh, if every ball of radius 3 delta contains at most eta and vertices, then uh, there are very few short edges in this graph H. Uh, Yuri? Yeah. Clear. When you're considering the balls and distance between vertices, you're only considering edges in H? Or uh, so the distance is defined with respect to oh, the SDP solution. And here, uh, what we are going to prove in the pi model, in this model, that this is true for the optimal uh, SDP solution uh, for the whole graph. And this statement, uh, this statement uh, uh, is proved for for the graph H, right? And uh, in a way, in a way, this happens because the SDP solution, very roughly speaking, depends more on the graph G than on the graph H. And so it just happens that in H all edges are pretty much along. So uh, this property may look a little bit mysterious. So let me just, uh, let me illustrate why it's, it's plausible. Uh, let me prove that random G and P graphs satisfy it. So we don't need that in our result because we don't study uh, random GNP graphs here, but just to give you some idea why it, it's not mysterious and what it, what it means. Uh, and later, uh, I will explain why it, call, why it also holds in the pi model, in our model. <coughs> so suppose that we fix an SDP solution, and let's assume that each ball of radius 3 delta contains at most e to n vertices, then uh, if we take the union over all balls, uh, uh, then we get that the total number of uh, pairs UV such that the distance between U and V is less than 3 delta is at most eta n squared, right? This is just the union. And then when we sample a random G and epsilon graph, then we connect every two pairs U and V with probability epsilon. So, uh, you know, the fraction, uh, uh, the number of, the number of, the number of short, short, short edges should just multiply by epsilon. So we have this um, uh, inequality in expectation. And then using some kind of Chernoff bound, we get that with high probability, the number of short edges uh, is less than, say, 4 eta times the number of uh, edges in each, and in this case, the number of edges in each is epsilon n squared over 2. Right? So we get 
uh, the desired bound. So we get this bound only for this fixed SDP solution, of course. But uh, we can bound the total number of SDP solutions and then use the union bound. And the Chernoff bound that gives us this inequality uh, will show that this is true for every SDP solution. So this is roughly speaking why this property holds uh, for random gen epsilon graphs. And at least I hope that now it's, it's, it's kind of plausible that this, this kind of property may hold. Uh, now I want to explain how we use this property. And in the end of my talk, I will say why it's true for uh, graphs in our model. So the reason for that is very different. <coughs> so uh, let's look at this property uh, once again. So we assume that in every ball um, of, of radius 3 delta, uh, so, so we, we, um, this property says that if every ball contains few uh, vertices, then the number of short edges in H is small. But after iteration T, uh, we remove all long edges from the graph, and we remove all clusters, all heavy clusters. So when we remove these heavy clusters, we ensure that every ball of radius 3 delta contains less than E10 vertices, and also all remaining edges between L and R are short. So in the graph that we obtain after iteration T, there are few edges between L and R. So there are at most C, eta, um, EH edges. And this said that um, after iteration T, uh, the cost of the optimal solution is small, and also the cost of the SDP solution is small. In particular, this means that we are making a progress and after uh, log log n iterations, the cost of the optimal solution goes down by a factor of square root log n, and we can and we can run the algorithm of Aurora around the design. Now, uh, this is what we do. Now, let me see why we when we, we perform our algorithm, we remove few edges. Uh, so. Uh, this is this is the variant of our, our algorithm without this fourth technical step. So when we remove all edges of length greater than delta, uh, we remove at most SDP over delta edges in total, because every edge that we remove contributes delta to the SDP solution, and so the total number of these edges is at most SDP over delta. And this bound holds not only for one iteration, but, but actually for all iterations. Because when we resolve the SDP solution, then the SDP value can only go down. Now, when we perform the third step, uh, we remove a ball of radius 3 delta that contains eta t uh, vertices it, 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 and ver at least it, it, and vertices, and this parameter at t uh, goes down ex um, exponentially. Uh, so uh, the cost of removing a ball of radius 3 delta is approximately the cost of the SDP solution at this iteration over delta. And this is the case because we uh, we, we don't simply remove this ball, but we consider a random neighborhood of this ball and remove it. And uh, the size of this neighborhood is roughly speaking delta. So this is pretty much a standard region growing argument. And uh, this cost SDP uh, it, uh, after it, uh, the, the SDP cost after iteration t over delta is is approximately e to t times the number of uh, ages in H. This is what I showed you on the previous slide. And the number of vertices that we remove is, is, is at least E to T n. So the cost per vertex is approximately uh, the number of ages in H over n. So the total cost of all these iterations is approximately SDP over delta plus at mo we remove at most n vertices, and each of them costs uh, E h over n. So the total cost is comparable to the uh, 
to, to, to the planted cost. So this is uh, roughly speaking how our algorithm works in this in this very simplified case um, uh, where graphs are irregular. Now let me show how we prove uh, this property. So, so probably I just have a few minutes, right? But I, I'll, I'll try to be uh, very fast here. So uh, we make this simplifying assumption that the graph G is capital D regular, H is small d regular, and capital T is much greater than D. And we want to show that if every ball of radius 3 delta contains at most eta and vertices, then the number of short edges is at most uh, eta times uh, the total number of edges times some constant. And uh, let me just remind you what our model is. So in our model, we start with two graphs, G and H. Then we take a random permutation pi, a random one-to-one -one map pi that maps vertices of H to vertices of G, and we uh, move these vertices of H and add them uh, to G. <coughs> so uh, the idea, uh, the main idea of our proof is the following. We want to prove that if it happens that the, the number of short edges uh, is much greater by a certain constant than eta times the total number of edges, then uh, this permutation pi has a short description. Or more formally, the Kolmogorov uh, prefix complexity of pi uh, is much smaller than the entropy of pi. And this cannot happen often. So if we just take a random permutation, right, then uh, most of the time the number of bits we need to record it uh, should be at least the entropy of this uh, permutation. Uh, so this is how we record the permutation. So first, we want to record our SDP solution. But if we record the whole SDP solution, it will require a lot of bits. <coughs> so instead, we, we do the following. We sample vertices of G and uh, vertices of H. We add every vertex of G to our sample with probability 1 over capital D, and every vertex of H with probability 1 over small uh, D, and we store distances between these ver vertices in the sample. And if we do that, it, it turns out that the number of bits uh, we need is very small, and we, 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 we can essentially ignore these bits, so pretty much for free we can uh, solve we can store the distances between these uh, sampled vertices. Also know that if we do that, then for every vertex in G, uh, with, with, with a constant probability, we will have exactly one uh, vertex in the sample, and also for every vertex in H, with a constant probability, we will have exactly one neighbor in the sample. Now uh, we want uh, to record our mapping pi, so let's consider x, and let's assume that this vertex x is mapped to a vertex u in the graph g. Uh, and with a constant probability, x has exactly one neighbor x prime in h, and u has exactly one neighbor u prime in g. So let's consider these vertices x prime and u prime. And let's assume further that edges x x prime and u u prime are short edges. So if x x prime and u u prime are short edges, then the distance between x prime and x is less than delta. Uh, the distance between u prime and u is less than delta by the definition, right? And x and u is the same vertex, right? We identify them. So uh, the distance between x and u is, is 0. So then it happens that the distance from u prime 
to x to x prime is at most two delta. Now, in order to record this correspondence x u, we record this sequence x x prime x prime u prime u prime u. Um, and when we write x x prime, we actually don't need to use any bits because because x prime is the only uh, neighbor of x. We assume that. Now, u prime lies in a neighborhood of radius 2 delta around x prime. So because of our assumption that there are no heavy clusters, there are at most eta n vertices in this ball of radius 2 delta around x prime. And uh, around eta n over d of them belong to the sample. So in order to re record u prime, we need to use uh, eta log of eta n over d bits. And finally, we, we record this correspondence u prime to u. And u prime is a vertex in G. We assume that each vertex in G has degree at most uh, exactly, exactly capital D. So uh, we need log D bits to uh, record u. So in total, uh, to record this correspondence, we need this, no this number of bits, logarithm of eta n over d plus log d. We simplify that, get log eta n bits. Uh, now, <coughs> when, does, when does this work? So uh, when we did that, first of all, we assumed that uh, uh, x and u have exactly one vertex, oh, sorry, x and u have exactly one neighbor in the sample, but this happens with constant probability, so it's good. Now we also need uh, that x, x prime is short and u, u prime is short. Now for most, most edges in the graph g are short because the number of edges in the graph g is much larger than the, the number of, your, of, of edges in the graph H, and if many edges in the graph G were long, then they would contribute a lot to the SDP solution. So we know that uh, most edges in G are long, and essentially we can ignore this possibility that U U prime uh, is long. So, mo mo so sorry, most most edges are short, and we can ignore the possibility that U U prime uh, is long. Now. Uh, so, so, so essentially, if x x prime is short, then we can record this correspondence x x prime u prime u, and we need approximately log eta n bits for that. Now, uh, what is uh, what is the number of short edges in 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 h? It's it's rho n. I mean, we, we denoted this number by rho n, and so roughly speaking we can write this correspondence for, um, uh, for rho n vertices. Let's uh, denote the set of these vertices by capital X. And so we can record pi of x for vertices in capital X using log e to n bits by like pair vertex. Uh, and we, we also need to record this set x. And to do that, uh, we need... Uh, approximately rho n times log 1 over rho bits. Uh, so in total to store uh, this pair x and the restriction of pi to x, we need rho n time, times log um, n over rho n bits. Uh, but the entropy of this pair x and the restriction of pi to x is rho, rho n log n. And uh, the description, the description should be at least uh, the entropy. Only with very small probability it happens that uh, this pair has a shorter description than the entropy. And so we get um, that with, with, with high probability rho is smaller than eta. And this means uh, that the number of short uh, 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 the number of short edges is smaller than eta n 
uh, is smaller than eta times the total number of edges. And this is basically the analysis of this part, and it shows uh, that if there are no clusters, then most edges um, then most edges are long in H, and there are very few uh, short edges in H. Any questions? Okay, so actually, this is everything I wanted to see about our algorithm. Now let me just summarize what we did. And we introduced a new model for balanced cut, um, which generalizes many previously studied models. Uh, we give a constant factor approximation algorithm in, in, in this model. It's interesting to understand whether this model is realistic, whether instances that arise in practice are from this model, and also uh, try, it's interesting just to try this algorithm or similar algorithms uh, on real-world instances. It would be, of course, also very interesting to get more general results study perhaps better models for this and other combinatorial optimization problems. Thank you, and happy Pi Day, which will be this, this uh, Friday. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Yuri. So does anyone in the audience have any questions? I have a question that's along the similar line as my others. Is there a way to unify this algorithm with the previous algorithm so you get one algorithm that works in all these cases and is kind of reasonable? Um, okay, I mean, formally, this, you know, so, so this algorithm is, 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 um, is more involved than the algorithm of um, Feige and Killian, but just the analysis of Feige and Killian also showed that this algorithm solves the instances. So, in the, but, but, I mean, but by trivial reason, just because pretty much they prove that any SDP algorithm solves uh, the instance. Uh, so, um, I, if there is a model that generalizes, uh, formally generalizes their model and this model, mm, I don't know. Any more questions? I had I had one more question. Um, this is just about the proof. I I lost. I'm I'm missing a bit in my head. Um, so the entropy argument. You say that you can represent the permutation pi using too few bits. But what you're using is that you know the vectors. Right. So how? Um, so. Do you have a short representation for the SDP vectors, or how does that work? Right. So, so this is um, what we do. We, we cannot uh, record there everything, right? It would require a lot of bits. So we cannot uh, rec uh, record the whole SDP solution. So instead, we sample uh, our uh, SDP. Uh, we sample our graph, so we take a sample of vertices in the graph G, we take a sample of vertices in the graph H, and then we store distances between uh, uh, between between these vertices. Yes, and basically we store vectors, SDP vectors, for uh, these um, uh, vertices. There are very few of them. Okay. So we can afford to do that, and uh, yes, we, we also project them to, uh, to to some very small dimensional uh, space, and we take uh, so some epsilon net on, on the, in the unit sphere. But so, so we need very few bits for for every um, uh, for every vector. Even, but but in fact, if, if we don't uh, care much about log n factors, then we can uh, use pretty crude uh, tools here. Um, All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? So if there are no more questions, I would like to apologize for the technical problems we had. We also lost an India 
he wrote me an email that the connections he had broke down, so that's very unfortunate. So in the name of the TCS Plus organizers, thanks to everyone, and I hope I will see you next in two weeks when we have Ryan Williams, or in four weeks when we have David Woodroff, or after that when we have John Ding. And thanks a lot, Yuri, for the excellent talk, and um, have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Thank you Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.